Hey guys, Sleepy Reader here. Uh, coming at you with a, a comic book review of this past Wednesday's comics. Um, in yet another parking lot. Um, I could probably find 20 parking lots right by my office before I run out of ones to film these fascinating in-car videos. Um, so, this week I actually got to the comic book store on Wednesday and, um, and read seven of my 11 comics that I bought uh, Wednesday night, um, which was amazing and I was sure I was going to either Thursday morning or Thursday night uh, record a video and put it up for you guys, you know, real quick. Uh, be one of the quick ones for once, um, but things happened on Thursday and I had absolutely no opportunity to uh, read any more comics or, or make a video or whatever. So today the comics I'm gonna look at, review, uh, include, let's start this way, um, Justice League Dark, I Vampire, The Flash, uh, The Punisher War Zone, Red Lanterns, Talon, Talon number one, ooh, valuable, and Batman Inc. number four. Um, so that's, I think that's seven of the comics. The other ones, there were more Marvels, but um, most of the Marvels I'm reading I'm not caught up on. Uh, so like I got um, Journey into Mystery, but I have like three books from the Journey into Mystery Thor series to read to catch up on, and what else did I get? Uh, I can't think of them. But uh, other things like that. Oh, like X-Men Extreme. And I had X-Men Extreme 5 came out. And I was excited about that. But I haven't actually read 3 or 4 yet. <laughs> so, um, Batman Inc. was a bit of a disappointment. And I'm actually thinking about just dropping Batman Inc. now. We know it's not going to go on for much longer. And we know it's kind of out of sync with all the other Batman titles. Uh, if you guys remember, and I have trouble now remembering what's going on fully. If you guys remember issue zero though, that was a really weak issue in which it was just kind of a review of the gathering of the forces of Batman Inc. of recruiting people. Um, and I found it, and it was written by Grant Morrison and Chris Burnham, and I found out in an interview with Chris Burnham that it was entirely his plotting, and then Grant Morrison came in at the end and put in some dialogue. So that may explain why that issue was very pedestrian. Uh, there was nothing special about it. This one had, I mean, it had the great Chris Burnham art, and it had a lot of interesting details, a lot of interesting moments, but I, unlike the first three Batman Inks, I couldn't put it all together well enough. I mean, even given the Grant Morrison effect, where you expect to be a little, a little confused. Um, I can't remember all of these members of Batman Inc. all being called into Gotham. And I couldn't, I couldn't keep track of them and what was going on. Uh, so, I don't know if I'll really drop Batman Inc., but, but I'm, I'm tempted. And the final decision that's made in the end, I'm sure, I guess the obvious thing is it'll turn out to be a fake-out and not true. Um, how not to spoil this. I might spoil this a little bit, so you might want to skip when you see me not holding up Batman Inc. again. Um, this because I'm going to talk about the very end of this issue. Um, and I'll put down the comic book when I'm done talking about it. So, the, at the end, um, Batman tells Robin Damien that the best solution is for him to go back to Talia. Um, and that seems crazy, although it might be fun to see Robin go back to Talia for a few months, or, you know, for a little bit. One, it, it totally interferes with um, whatever's going on in the Batman and Robin book, which I like a lot. Um, 
I like the Batman and Robin comic book a lot, so maybe that's part of my thought of why to drop this. But I suppose what it'll turn out is this is another, you know, fake within a fake of Batman uh, trying to fake out Talia by returning Damien to her. Um, why, why we think Talia wants Damien back as opposed to wanting to kill him? Um, I just, I can't put together all the pieces of, of this book. So, yeah, without being able to put everything together, uh, is it worth continuing to read? Is it worth the effort and the money? Um, if it were a four nine, a four dollar book, I definitely would drop it right now. Probably the Chris Burnham art will keep me coming back. But it was definitely one of the weaker, weaker books of the week. And it, uh, and that surprised me because this is definitely uh, one of the ones I usually really look forward to. And I, one that I wasn't really looking forward to, I read the zero issue of Talon and thought it was a solid origin issue as far as origin issues go, which are never the really exciting issues. Um, and I, th I considered not picking up Talon, but, um, but I just wanted to see what they were going to do with it. And it is Scott Snyder-ish. Scott Snyder is credited as a co-plotter here. I still haven't figured out... Someone said that James Tinian has actually uh, been the solo, sole writer on a book. Um, but I haven't, I haven't found that yet. Um, but judging from what we see here, it might be that what Scott Snyder has worked on is maybe the overall arc of the plot or something. Because the plotting itself doesn't have his usual wonderful sense of timing and, and uh, you know, really well done reveals and such that I've, that I've come to expect from Scott Snyder. So I s assume that, that uh, Snyder's only had a little to do with the plot. So, so like, like Batman Inc., it was one of the more disappointing books of the week, and I can't decide whether I'll continue to pick it up. It'll probably probably be one that I'll watch other people's reviews, and if they if other people continue to like it, you know, one or two or three issues down the line, I'll just seek out the back issues and and come back on Talon. Um, of course, I could be lying. I maybe I'll just grab it up next time it's out. Uh, impulse buyer. Um, I have to say the one of the strengths of it is. You can definitely read this comic book without having read the Zero Issue, without even having read any of the Batman stuff that came before it. Um, this comic book does what I wish more comic books would do, which is just quickly fill you in um, on what's going on in an effective, meaningful way, so that if you just happen, if this happens to be the first issue of Talon you've ever bought, um, it'll make sense to you, and you can you can pick up on the plot. Um, much, it's pretty close to the way they did it in, you know, 80s comic books or something, although without a whole lot of flashback sequences, but uh, fills you in in a lot of captions. Um, so I really like that uh, James Tinian did that. Um, and there's some, there's some good action sequences. I'm, I'm going over the positive here. So the positive is there's some good action sequences where we see how Talon's sort of fighting style is, and his general style of doing things, is the, the escape artist, the person who can get through doors and find little hatches and ways to get out of places. Um, and there's a cool fight sequence with a female Talon. <clears throat> but other than that, this is... This is too basic of a comic for me. It is a lot like an early 80s or 70s comic book, more like a 70s comic book, uh, where the hero just comes in, has a fight, meets someone who's going to help him, and they decide to team up. And it's very basic and vanilla. Uh, kind of like when I last week reviewed um, the Black, new Black Lightning book, I think this would be a good book for a less experienced younger comic book reader, you know, say a 12-year-old who hasn't read a lot of comics, would probably find this pretty cool and, and a good basic kind of superhero setup, even though Talon's a little bit of an anti-hero because he's more out 
for himself. By the end of the issue, he just quickly decides to um, to fight the good fight and join up with the guy who wants to help him bring down bring down the court of owls. Um, as a sort of older quote, more sophisticated comic book reader, I. I think, one, we aren't going to really bring down the Court of Owls because they're going to be reused for more uh, Batman stuff. Um, they're just too cool of super, uh, not super villains, too cool of a, a secret villain organization. Two, I, I wonder why the guy who recruits talent to help him bring down the Court of Owls hasn't recruited other people from the Bat family, other heroes in Gotham. Um, <clears throat> And he's, you know, he's been waiting all these years. Uh, he and as uh, Da Costa DC said, he is. I can't remember his name or the character. It's like the character in Blade, played by Chris Christopherson, the kind of the guy who helps Blade or helps Talon uh, bring down the bad guys, um, working in the background, <clears throat> half mentor, half assistant. Um, and I think another reason why uh, the the artwork by um, Gilliam Marsh was was decent standard superhero artwork, but there was nothing special about it for me. And I think the coloring the coloring did not work very well for me. It wasn't awful, but it it just didn't it didn't pop very much for me. It didn't uh, it didn't make the comic book easier to read. It made the comic book a little harder to read. So yeah, uh, it seems like everyone else's reviews for Talon have been positive. So uh, I'm sure I'll, I'll watch what everyone else says in the next few issues. <clears throat> Red Lanterns. This is my guilty pleasure. Um, I don't know if I should keep getting it as it ties into the rise of the Third Army because I'm not going to follow that till it all comes out into trade. Uh, I just love the art artwork in here, as I say every month, um, and it continues to be good. Uh, the story, you know, the Red Lanterns is not very deep as a as a comic book, but the story itself is about really grim, awful stuff, you know, involving uh, rape and murder and and slavery and such. Um, so I feel a little uncomfortable in a way reading it as just a light read. <laughs> But as a light read, I enjoyed it. Um, uh, and even though I can only guess that these creatures come from the from the Third Army plot line, so that was a little confusing for me. Um, but I still I still enjoy the artwork a lot. Uh, so yeah, this was kind of in the middle of my pile in terms of stuff I liked. Punisher War Zone. Uh, this is a continuation, or almost like a epilogue or a capstone. Uh, Ghost Critic put it well, and I can't remember exactly how he said it. Of the Greg Rucka Punisher run, and now the Punisher is sort of facing the consequences of what happened in the 16 issues of that run, um, and so we're getting a mini series where he's going to have to face off with the Avengers. And I didn't love the art. This is an artist who I liked fairly well on on Journey into Mystery, but he doesn't seem very good for the Punisher or for superheroes. Um, and I didn't like the coloring, which seemed to kind of obscure the art. Um, it's interesting that this coloring is by Matt Hollingsworth, the same colorist who does... Um, Hawkeye, and it's, you know, an utterly different kind of style of coloring. I would say, if anything, um, a totally unrecognizable. It, it makes me wonder if there's something that that the artist has done to to direct the way the colorist works. Maybe there's a, a, wa a gray wash that he's applied over his own pencils, or his own uh, inks and pencils, to guide the colorist. Um, because in a way the coloring looks very similar to the way it looked in uh, Journey into Mystery. So, 
this this is also on the edge of whether I should pick up the whole miniseries or not. And the reason why for me is um, there's kind of a this relationship between the Punisher and the superheroes is troubling, and I don't know if I'm interested in in examining the Punisher's relationship to the superheroes in kind of a serious way. Um, it'd be fun to see, you know, the Punisher somehow beating off the whole Avengers. But part of me, if, if when it's done too seriously, and it's done kind of seriously here, seriously, I don't think the Punisher can can uh, face off against the Avengers. And seriously, I don't think the Avengers would have such a complicated moral position with the Punisher. Um, he's just, he goes where they don't go. And they have very good reasons for doing things the way they do. And they would see him... So in this issue, they ha different members of the Avengers question whether they should go after the Punisher. And one actually betrays his fellow Avengers to help out the Punisher. Another thing that bothered me is there was a, a fight with the Punisher and Spider-Man, and I felt like the Punisher beat Spider-Man way too easily. Um, and, uh, you know, traditionally, originally, the Punisher was a Spider-Man villain, and Spider-Man always beat him in the end. There might be a bit of a struggle, but... You know, Spider-Man is Spider-Man, and the Punisher is the Punisher. I think what was so good about the Rucka run is it wasn't like a superhero comic. Um, even though it, at the fringes, had, you know, superhero devices that, uh, that the Punisher was, the Punisher and the bad guys were dealing with. So, um, bringing him back to the superheroes, maybe that's good for sales, but I kind of liked him in the shadows away from the superheroes. Flash, number 13, was a mixed bag, but mostly good. Um, I enjoyed it quite a bit. I enjoy seeing the gorillas invade the city. And, you know, this invasion of the city was done quite realistically. <laughs> uh, they're really hurting people, and they're, you know, it's not just the superheroes and the villains. There's the whole city involved, and I like that. The art, you know continues to be fantastic <clears throat> and uh, so let's see where did I yeah it, it has me looking forward to the next issue it was kind of cool how the rogues uh, flashes group of supervillains uh, the rogues, uh, how they respond to the emergency of the gorillas invading the city and how they get involved. I want to know more. This woman had, uh, what's her name? Now I've forgotten her name. This kind of ghostly sup supervillain woman who has some attraction to the Flash and the Flash has some attraction to her. I'm looking forward to seeing more, more of her. What, what is kind of the, the negative side of the Flash is the continuation of just more and more loose ends. Um, and I think that I don't fully, the, the writers are the artists, the colorist and the artist, and they're good, they do a good job, but I don't totally trust them to, to be in control of things and to totally put things back together. Um, <clears throat> it's like, in, my, in the back of my mind, I'm sensing the writer's insecurity, like that they have to keep the ball rolling forward so much, so fast, that there's little pieces spinning out, and, and I can't see how they're ever going to bring them all back together. Although they do make little call-outs to them here and there. There's someone who's looking for Iris West, who's still been trapped in the Speed Force for like six issues, I think. Maybe, maybe seven issues. Um, but it is, you know, as everyone knows, it's so pleasurable to, uh, to just look at the art. Um, I will, as long as Francis Manipool is drawing it, I will continue to get the flash and, and want to get it in floppies, not in trades, because the art looks so nice on two-page spreads, etc. Um, yeah, so... 
good, but just continuing the same reservations. Uh, the latest issue of I Vampire number 13, I didn't hold up the comic book right now because a woman just got out of her car and was looking at me. And I'm particularly embarrassed to being a comic book reader in front of women. Sad to say. Uh, so I Vampire uh, was really good. Now um, the vampires have all been turned human, I guess. Um, and we get the point of view of Bloody Mary now as a, as a human. And it's really cool. Um, and, and we uh, start to see what Andrew Bennett's going to be like as a totally evil, super powerful, only vampire in the universe or in the unearth kind of guy. Um, I wonder if we're going to get a situation where there's a group of vampire hunters sort of chasing after Andrew Bennett. The one problem for me is there's a character here, now I can't find her name. In the second half of the book there's a character who lives out in a cabin in Maine and Andrew Bennett's come for her and then um, uh, Mary and her fellows come for her. This is interesting. Mary seems to have a... Um, wait, who is that? There is another vampire. I'm gonna have to reread this actually. Figure it all out. Anyhow, the, the art is brilliant. I do believe this is an artist who uses a lot of Photoshop, but, but I think he does it very well. The coloring is really excellent. Um, they work, the art and the colorist work together in concert great. The artist being Andrea Sorrentino and the colorist being Marcelo Mialo. Mialo? Um, I heard Marcelo interviewed, so I know that he's from Brazil. Um, Andrea Sorrentino, I'm not sure where he's from. So, uh, yeah, it's just, it's wonderful art, wonderful coloring, uh, intense story. I, I guess I eventually need to get the trade of the first seven issues, six issues, and just catch up on the whole I Vampire lore. Um, but I'm really glad I, I've picked it up and stuck with it despite, you know, some of the confusion. Um, so my one complaint is, this is a picture of Maine. <laughs> This is why I'm pretty sure Andrea Sorrentino uh, does not live in the U.S. and has never been to Maine, because those look like mountains in Al in the Alps or mountains at least in the Rocky Mountains. Maine is low, rolling hills, a few small mountains here and there. Uh, to my knowledge, there's nothing like that in Maine. Um, if you live in Maine or have explored Maine really well and have seen mountains like that, you can tell me. I go to Maine every summer, um, and at least in the parts of Maine I've ever seen, I've never seen any any large snow-capped mountain range. Um, Maine would be very snowy in the winter, but it would be all low rolling hills and lots of trees. So, <laughs> and what and since that's done on a double-page spread, it was particularly noticeable to me, and it was probably photoshopped in with a picture of of some major mountain range from somewhere in the world. So yeah, great book. Another great book and, and even better than I, well, well above my expectations, was Justice League Dark number 13, uh, written by Jeff Lemire, uh, and still being drawn by this very good artist, Mikhail Jenin. Um, but the the ride with Jeff Lemire on Justice League Dark for me has been up and down a lot. Some issues will be really good and other issues kind of feel forced or a little weak. The Zero issue I thought was especially weak. Um, maybe he wrote it really rushed. It does, it does int the Zero issue introduced an important character and he's immediately in play in this issue. And while I didn't find that character very interesting, he just seemed like a cliche in the Zero issue, here he comes off as a really interesting villain, and so his past relationship with uh, Constantine and Zantana uh, pays off really nicely and makes for some really horrific stuff near the end of the book. Um, uh, Mikhail Janin is a really good artist who, so my only complaint, and it's increasing because I've noticed this all along, 
with his art is a super overuse of Photoshop. And he uses that to, most of all, to, to create a sense of magic. And it just, it doesn't integrate as well with the drawing part of the, of the pictures for me as, as I think it should. Um, so I'm, I, every time I read a pan or see a page like that, part of my mind is thinking Photoshop, Photoshop, Photoshop as I'm reading the story and I, uh, and I sort of see it in two layers. I see all this Photoshop stuff and then I have to sort of look through it to see what the action is and what's going on. Um, there's something to be said, even though the Photoshop opens sort of unlimited abilities for the, for the artists, there's something to be said with working with, with the limitations of whatever medium you're working in. Um, so, anyway, it's not a big enough complaint to, still this is, you know, easily my favorite comic book of the week and one of my favorite comic books of the month. Um, and it's gonna, it says it's gonna conclude in the annual, which is coming out next week, so that's really cool to get the full story real quickly, um, even though it will cost me more money. Another, these, another aspect of Justice League Dark is these incredible covers by Ryan Sook. I'd love to see him draw an issue of Justice League Dark, but I suppose he doesn't really draw comic books anymore, just covers. So yeah, the, uh, overall, a, a kind of middling week other than Justice League Dark and I Vampire, everything was okay. I didn't feel ripped off and I was happy to have read all of these comic books, but, but I wasn't like, wow, we're in a golden age of comic books, which some weeks I do feel that way. Um, so, so, but I'm happy enough. Uh, I also, from last week, I never discussed uh, before Watchmen Minutemen which was an excellent, another excellent issue by Darwin Cook, and it's, it's pushing further. His first issue was too close to the Watchmen, and with each issue, I think he pushes further into the things he really wants to explore. And it's really dark and adult, but in a, a different way than, than something Alan Moore would do. It's more, uh, it's less fancy than something Alan Moore would do, but it, it's more earnest and um, honest about the horrible things in the world. And, the, and it kind of makes the whole idea of the horrible things in the world and how you deal with them and whether you can deal with them is dealt with explicitly in this issue. And I haven't been reading the comic, the comedian comic book, uh, but we get an excellent sort of beat character beat for the comedian where he explains some of his World War II experience and you know we really see where his character goes down the toilet you know mentally um, and uh, it's kind of in its own way in a different way from Alan Moore but another whole way to uh, de-romanticize all kinds of things in comic books and adventure fiction and other kinds of things um, that is normally glossed over romantically. Uh, but I almost didn't want to, it, it, it depressed me and I'm not really in the mood for depressing comics. Uh, so it's kind of a brilliant depressing comic book. So yeah, uh, thanks for joining me and um, I will probably continue to make a lot of videos. It's, this has become, an, for now, an important part of my life. Uh, and I love watching everyone else's videos, so I want to be part of that conversation. So, uh, talk, to you, talk to everyone later. I wish I could think. There's probably something more I wanted to say. Your words of love to you, the shadows of